I'm Bruce Bloomer. First and foremost, I'm a preacher's kid. My dad is a retired United Methodist pastor, so grew up uh, on potlucks. Been involved in fundraising at the national level for the United Methodist Church and currently also a vice president for development. So happy to be that you're listening to the Happy Hippie Jesus Show. All right, Bruce, welcome to the show. We're glad you're here. Hey, glad to be with you. Thanks. Yes, Bruce, I'm very glad you're here. I need a favor from you. I can do that. See, Bill has this crazy idea that Jesus is a hippie to the exclusion of everyone that's not a hippie. And I want (laughs) you to convince him that Jesus would have grace for Wall Street bankers. Now, I didn't say that. Look, uh, you've seen me, Jeremy. Of course, I'm going to think Jesus can be a hippie because I think Jesus can be like anybody. And I want Jesus to be kind of like me. (laughs) Yeah, there's there's no logical fallacies or godlike complexes in that. Jesus looks exactly <laughs> like me, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a product of the you know, 60s and 70s, so I, I kind of feel like maybe Jesus was a hippie. You know, I, I, I look at people who are a little bit countercultural and were passionate, deeply passionate about things, and I think that kind of defines Jesus. I think countercultural and care deeply about lots of things. I think that maybe Jesus was a hippie. Since you feel like Jesus is kind of a hippie, like I do, I'd love to ask you to share a story that kind of lets our audience know how you see Jesus. You know, I've used this, used this story uh, a few times, but I, I, it really kind of leads into my book also. I grew up in a small town, and in that small town, there was a creek that ran through the town. And I'm pretty sure there's an electromagnet between kids and creeks. And so we were down exploring this creek. It was springtime, so the creek was, you know, pretty full and and flowing pretty fully, but it was still cold out. It was still winter in our part of the world, and so we had on our snow pants and snow boots and and, uh, parkas and so forth. So there was this old bridge that extended out over the the creek, and I was kind of a chubby kid. So the theory was if the bridge will hold the fat kid, the bridge will hold the rest of us. Well, the bridge did hold for a while, and then I fell in the creek. And I remember being underwater and kind of struggling to get to the surface. And I remember really distinctly thinking, this is probably not a good thing. And I finally did make it to the surface and got pushed across to the other side of the creek. Well, the town whistle went off. And if you didn't grow up in a small town, you may not know that that meant that it was supper time. But what it meant for me was I was in big trouble, that grandma had come to visit. And the last thing mom said was, you better not be late for supper. And so I made a really poor decision. I tried to swim back across the creek. But it's hard to swim in snow pants and parkas and snow boots. And I barely made it back to the same side. And my only option was is to walk to a road bridge about a half a mile away and then trudge home. And as I'm walking home, I'm thinking to myself, man, I am in such trouble. Mom is going to be so angry with me. And when I got home and mom saw this frozen, frightened kid and Peering out of this icy winter garb, she just gave me a big hug and warmed me up and gave me something to eat. And I use that story because I think it's an illustration of grace. We test God. We go under. Sometimes we get pushed away from God. All of us make really poor decisions. There are times when we maybe have to walk or feel like we're walked way far away from God, but when we come back, what we expect maybe is anger or judgment, and what we receive from God is the warm embrace. And so to me, that's a a good illustration of how I view my relationship with God and 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 also how I view grace. It's a really great story. I like it. I'm going to borrow it for a sermon one day soon. You are welcome. (laughs) It's, It's public domain. (laughs) You have, I guess, a new book out about grace. And I'm just curious, what inspired you to write that book? Yeah, I was I was working with the United Methodist Church on a national level, and I was raising funds for scholarships. And I was traveling literally from Alaska to Florida and Maine to California. And I was spending a lot of time and I'm all by myself and in airports and hotel rooms. And I think I need to have something better to do with my time than just watch TV or, you know, walk around circles. And so I, I, I wanted the idea of, of putting a book together. And so I, was, I met with a couple of local pastors and I said, you know, what would be helpful for you? And one of them said really clearly, I'd love to have a book on grace. Um, I'd been writing a, a, a blog for a couple of years. It was started out as called Parsonage Parables, kind of as a preacher's kid, kind of sharing stories with my my brothers and sisters, but expanded onto sort of my just kind of my random thoughts about life. And so I had a bunch of these stories already available. 
and started to dig into Wesley's views of grace and his categories of grace, and it really just came together well. I was working with the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry at the time, and they have a publishing house, and so I pitched them this idea of writing a book on grace to simplify grace but also tell it through my stories and the stories of others. And so that's how it came to be, kind of motivation from a pastor to say that would be helpful. And then, honestly, the book really just fell together. And I started with John Wesley's categories of grace and then just dropped in my stories and, and brought in the stories of others. And so it was it was really a really fun project to put together. Bill will put links to both your blog and the book in the show notes because Perfect. all of our listeners know Bill does all the work and is the only one that understands technology. Well, as long as one of you do, that's a, it's perfect, right? <laughs> exactly. You collected these stories. and I'm really interested in that collection process. Obviously, the ones from your own life and from your brothers and sisters, those came pretty easy. What was it like collecting the stories from people that you weren't related to? You know, I think one of the real God moments for me when I was putting this book together is I was thinking about my faith journey. And, and it really came to me is that my faith journey is not your faith journey or Bill's or whoever, that we all see God and seek God in really different ways. And I read a little bit about you that both of you come from a, maybe a non-traditional background to become pastors. And so, you know, I think we all have a very different faith journey. And so I was just thinking about, I don't want people to think that there's only one way to seek God or find God and, and encounter God. And so I reached out to some pastor friends and, and I said, hey, I'm putting this book together, but at the end of every chapter, I'd like to put what I call a simply grace story, which is, you know, stories about people who had very different faith experiences in mind. And they sent me the greatest collection of stories and peoples. And I just reached out to them, these individuals and said, hey, I'm putting a book together. I'd love to have a, your story if you're willing. And they sent me their stories and it was just unbelievable. You know, there's a guy who was in prison for selling meth and a, a, a man who was addicted to pornography and a, a person who whose father assaulted her when she was a child and almost committed suicide then became a chief of police. I mean, it's just these incredible faith stories that were so different than mine. But we all kind of found, you know, that we had this winding path that ended sort of in the same direction. And the great stories really, I think, were a great addition to my book because I think people will see that there is not one path, but it's multiple winding hills and valley paths that lead in the same direction to God. That's certainly all of our stories, and we're all collectors of stories on some level. Why don't you pick a story that really moved you and just tell us that story and then tell a little bit about why it spoke to you where you were? There are several in there, but the one that really was just surprising to me is there was a woman who was assaulted by her father when she was a child. And she went to her parents and or went to, you know, to report that and, and they didn't believe her. And so here's this woman living or the girl living with this this terrible background and she she went on and she was she one day she was sitting at a at a, a stop sign and she this woman driving a police car pulled up to the intersection and stopped and she said to herself I'm going to become a police officer. And so she went through the process and trained to be a police officer. When she was a police officer, she picked up someone who for uh, domestic assault and put the man in the back of the car, just had this interesting conversation with this man and ended up letting him go. Weird set of circumstances, but wouldn't let him go. But after that, she almost committed suicide. She took her service revolver and put it in her mouth and she was ready to end it all. And she just felt like this presence of God was saying there's more. And she went on to become a, a chief of police for a small town and then started this organization to reach out to victims of sexual assault. So, you know, a, a story that could end very tragically ended up where she had this incredible call, an incredible um, way to reach out to other people who had gone through what she had gone through and said, let me change the, the trajectory of your life. So she's still very actively involved in, in, in the, uh, identifying these people who have gone through some, some kind of trauma and, and helping them to a better path. And so you love it when it turns out well like that, because it certainly could end up a lot differently. And I would say that's 
the beauty of Christianity and our faith that our worst moments, those low points are never or never have to be our defining moments. Peter's not defined by denying Jesus, but by the grace after Paul's not defined by, you know, the stonings, but what he goes on to do, we don't define Jesus by, you know, the death, but by resurrection. Right. Yeah. You know, the other thing, I would, the other kind of just general category stories is, is just sort of death stories. And that sounds a little, little morbid here on the, on the morning podcast. But through death experiences, people found grace in, the, in that process and how um, really God had spoken to, through that person who had died uh, in, in a variety of ways. And so the end of one of my chapters, it talks about some of these experiences that people have gone through as their spouse or close friend or relative uh, was passing away or dying. And so I think, again, there's tragedy, but there's also resurrection stories uh, and life stories within someone, someone leaving this physical earth. I was at a spiritual formation academy recently, and the woman was talking about healing. And she said one of the last forms and maybe the most complete form of healing is death. Right. In that there is hope and healing, especially for us as Christians. So I think that ties in nicely. with yeah. Most of the stories at the end of each chapter have this element of hope. And I think grace really does speak towards hope. Could you maybe talk about what grace means to you? Yeah, you know, and one of the things that uh, when I was beginning the book is I thought, you know, we really banter that word around a lot, don't we? I mean, we use that, we use the word grace in songs and it's in prayers. We talk about the grace of God, but really what is it? And in the end, I really found that simply grace is the love of God. Yeah, it's the undeserved, unmerited love of God and that it's available to us despite who we are or what we've done. And it, we all have a story and we all have elements of grace in our life. But to know that the love of God is always ready and available and waiting, honestly, for us is pretty comforting for me. In the book, I kind of go through that introduction to what I think grace is and and try to simplify grace. And then I use uh, John Wesley's categories of grace. I take his, his words, which are provenient grace and justifying grace and sanctifying grace. And I just try to simplify them saying, hey, let's let's not talk about the theological words. Let's talk about what they are and let's let's say what the categories are and, and really how Wesley tries to just say it's not really categories, but it helps us maybe define what our path is towards towards trying to develop a relationship with God. And so I, I think really simply grace is just the love of God. And I think the rest of it is just details that we that we can talk about. And there's very few things in all the universe that bring more hope than love, for sure. I agree. One of the stories that I found very interesting was the one in the second chapter about the young man who, when he was, uh, uh, I guess, 12 years old, his youth director led him in the uh, sinner's prayer so he could be saved. And then his life just went to pot. And it wasn't right. until he was uh, older that he felt like he truly was saved. And that was another another instance, like you said earlier, that our paths are always unique. I, we don't want to give away every story because I think that's <laughs> the best part of the book are the stories. But that question of why do, good, why do bad things happen to people who are saved? It, it seems like you were almost wanting to address that in that story. Yeah, you know, the, it, that how that story developed is also interesting. I, I'd been part of a morning Bible study for three years with these guys, and we met every Monday morning. It was a great group. We shared a ton. And so we went through this process to develop our spiritual autobiographies. And so we're just like, hey, what hap- What are some of the things that happened in our life? And then we tried to overlay. So, okay, how about some spiritual things? What are some spiritual key people, key events, key things that, that changed our our spiritual formation. And what I found out in that group is that fully 80% of that group had fathers who were dysfunctional or had passed away. And it was just blew me away. I'm like, I had spent three years with this guys and I had no idea that they didn't have that father figure in their life. And I have a very, my, my father's a great mentor for me. He's a great spiritual mentor for me. And to not have that influence was really, really it just was so surprising. And, and, the, and the story that you talked about 
I think is an unusual story because it usually it, it's someone who was a complete non-believer. He, he and had some rough things happen in his life. His father passed away at a very crucial time in his life, and he was a complete non-believer that met a woman who felt that became his wife. And he went through the process of trying to prove her wrong about why God does not exist and became a believer. And so I think he was such, he was such a negative uh, against all the, the, the relationships, uh, everything that God had taught. And I thought that is a great story of hope uh, that despite what happens in your life, despite where you're at currently, that hope exists and that hope's available. And so his story is unique, but I, I think the background of that is also it's just like, you know, we really never know what's going on in people's life. Um, you might have that, you know, that bright smile or that, you know, what's going, who knows what's going on in their life. And just behind that smile might be a terrible diagnosis or it might be a, a, a family member who's passed away. And, and, and you as pastors, you know, you deal with that all the time of people that right behind that facade is something that we don't know about. And so we need to show all people grace because we don't know what's going on right behind that, uh, behind that story, that the story that we see is another story we don't see. And we can kick this around to all of us if we want, but what are some good, simple, easy ways that we can show people grace on a daily basis? What, how can we show that love of God to each person we meet? I, I think the simple things, I think it's a smile. Um, I think it's giving people the, the doubt or the, the result of like, if you're driving and someone cuts you off, maybe, maybe they're on their way to something um, that I think we all need a break uh, in this society where it's, everything's instantaneous and fast and honestly polarized that there's no, so little middle ground that we need to start seeing some shades of gray that who knows what's going on. Uh, I don't know how, how far we're going to get into this, but the, the book that I wrote, I donate all the profits to our ministry that's that we we do in Haiti, and it's a it's a nonprofit called Laganava Live. We can talk more about that. But I was actually in Haiti during the earthquake in 2010, and I took this picture after the earthquake. It's the day after the earthquake, and we're sitting on this little island called Laganov, and we're looking back to the main island. And there's this incredibly beautiful, peaceful bay. There's a sailing sailboat out in the bay, and I'm like, this is this is a, a picture that I keep in front of me all the time. I have a picture of my office. I have a, it's a reminder photo for me that I'm seeing this incredibly peaceful, beautiful morning sunlit bay. And just across this island, just across this inlet, hundreds of thousands of people have died. People have been displaced. Incredible tragedy and misery happened. And so, again, it's that reminder photo for me. It may look peaceful at the front, but just behind that, some incredible, terrible things may happen. And so just see that picture in other people that in that face of a young mother or that that teenage boy or whoever it is, that elderly person who's driving slow in front of you, just remember that right behind that, right behind that face, maybe something that we're not aware of. The Haitian people, if it can happen to you, it does happen to you. They're like an island of the Jobs. Was it difficult to find instances of grace while you, you were there? Or do the people there find grace despite yeah, I am so impressed with the people's faith there. I, if I had one tenth of one percent of their faith, I'd be, I'd be a better person. I mean, they, and, and maybe it's because you're living always for hope, and that that the gospels and Jesus provide them so much hope. But they are so faithful and so appreciative of of the God's role in their life. And obviously, it's not everyone, but I have experienced deeper faith in Haiti than I have anywhere else. And um, the hope for good things to come, the hope that Jesus will help them and God will help them through their current status. And maybe more than anything, if you don't have all the material things that are right in front of you, maybe that's all you have. Uh, maybe that's all you have is that hope that a better day will be in front of you. But I am incredibly impressed with the faith, the deep faith and, and belief that God is is with them and will be with them and protect them I, I, far more than I see it here where we have everything and yet we don't, we struggle to believe at times. 
certainly life in Haiti is much closer to what a first century Palestinian or Jewish person would have experienced than life in America. I mean, sure. I mean, in many ways, we right. are the Romans of the story. We are empire. Since you're a collector of stories and you brought up you were in Haiti during the earthquake, can you tell us a story of finding grace in the midst of that tragedy or in the midst of the hmm. earthquake and its aftermath? Wow, it's hard to believe that it's almost been 10 years ago now. But one of the one of those stories that that just still kind of just gets me is we are so the earthquake had happened on a Tuesday and we had made a decision that on on by Thursday we'd already actually had received people from Port-au-Prince that came over to this little, little island it's an hour and a half away by boat it's an terrible trip. And, and we were seeing these people who had terrible injuries. A woman had a broken hip and some broken bones and burns and things like that. And so we just decided to close our clinic down. We just said, we can't handle this level of trauma. We don't have the capacity to deal with this. And so we just closed it down and we sent, said, everybody, just send your people to this hospital area. But we're so we're kind of just sitting around really not sure what to do. We, we're trying to make contacts of how to get off this little island and how we get back to the United States. And one of the men came up to me, it was a, a local man came up to me and he said, if you need anything, uh, just let me know. I can bring some food from my house to help. And I'm like, we have more food in our kitchen in, in, in our in our guest house than this man will have in five months. And so he offered this incredible, incredible gift of grace was saying, I will give you, I'll bring from my home anything that you need. And uh, I, that, that one still will just takes me back. Not all of our listeners are Methodist or Western. Sure. And the one, some, many of the ones that are <laughs> haven't been in confirmation for a long time. You mentioned the categories of grace that John Wesley used. Could you share with our audience uh, what those categories are and a little bit about each one? Yeah, sure. Well, there are really three categories, and and Wesley came up with the, these categories. The first one is actually a little bit unique in theology, and it's called provenient grace. And when I tell people, when you hear provenient, just think convenient. It's it's the convenient store that's on every corner. It's the convenient love of God that's always available. It's it's waiting. It's patient. Uh, it's it's that warm embrace, and so it's. Yeah, one of the examples that I that I use that I think is helpful is that in many faith traditions, people are not baptized until they're able to make a faith confession of their own. And so the United Methodist Church and some other traditions, we baptize infants. And so you want to say, well, why would you baptize an infant? And it's largely because of provenient grace that that Wesley believed that there's nothing you can do to earn God's grace. It's already available. So we as parents were simply accepting the provenient grace of God. So here's the grace that's that's it's it's always available. It's that convenient love of God. Then the second category is called justifying grace. And I want to tell people here justifying, just think testifying, that you're testifying to a change in your life, that you're accepting forgiveness from God. And now you're testifying that you have that step of belief and you're testifying to a change in your life. Some people call it being born again or or conversion experience or new life. And then sanctifying grace. I just tell people to think of the word steps. It's how do you step into this new relationship with God and how, what are the steps that you're going to take to, to perfect that relation or improve that relationship with God? And it's things that people already know about, which is like prayer and, and reading scriptures and attending, attending worship services, taking Holy Communion, fasting and dressing the needs of the world. So how are you going to take those steps then in perfecting your relationship? Wesley called those the means of grace. And they're just, just ways again, that you can go on to, to perfect or, or to take steps towards improving that relationship with God. It's a, it's a well-known kind of image that Wesley used and used a lot in the Nine Methodist Church that he said, look at the stages of grace and view it like this whole house or home. So provenient grace is like the, the porch. So it's conveniently located, the house. Maybe we hang out there a while. Maybe we lay in the hammock. But it's that convenient love of God that's, that's available and close to the house of God. 
And justifying grace is like the doorway. It's like God has hung up this large welcome sign. He's inviting you to testify to a change in your life and step across that threshold into the house of God. And then sanctifying grace is like the rooms of the house. And so each of those rooms are those means of grace. It's prayer and those and, and reading scripture and, and attending worship and Holy Communion. Those are all the different ways that then we can take a step towards improving and perfecting our relationship with God. So pretty quickly and briefly, those are the the three main categories. And I'll just include that. I I really think that it really starts with two things. I think it it starts with prayer, which Wesley calls the chief means of grace, which means he just believed that it all starts with prayer. And I think the second thing it starts with is creating space for God that we can't, we have to carve out space for lots of things, but if we never carve out space for God, we can't improve that relationship with God. So I think that's where it starts. It doesn't have to be these elaborate uh, pastoral prayers. It's just simple relations or simple conversations with God, simple times for prayer. And then how do you carve out space so that God is also a priority with all the other hundred thousand uh, priorities that we have and, and influences that we have. How do we start out with that relationship? It's prayer and creating space for God. That's a really good question. Bill, do you want to answer? How are you carving out space for God right now? What does it look like for you right now, Bruce, to carve out space for God? Yeah. And I think a lot of it, honestly, one of the things that I do that I it's been the best for me is I, I go on bike rides and walks. I just feel like um, that's a that's my time where there's no cell phone, there's no one calling, there's nobody tugging on my sleeve. That's my time away, and I just I view that time just my walking time and exercise, or mostly biking until the snow flies out here. Um, uh, that's a great time for me. It just helps me to to think and to uh, spend time without other distractions. That's my, that's a time that's been really helpful. And then I'm trying to make sure that every morning I start with my prayer list that I go through my, I try to keep a physical prayer list and add people to that and concerns where that come up. So I make sure that I'm praying specifically for people. So I try to start my day with that, with uh, going through my prayer list and then, you know, carving out these times where I can know that I can spend some time really thinking about what's the next thing and what do I need to be doing in my life? That's important. And those are I guess things we would describe as very important, but they're never urgent. So they're easy to push aside. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's easy to try to schedule over them unless you're intentional. So very good. Yeah. And then, and then the phone call comes or the email comes, the text comes and all of a sudden I'm off doing something else. And so, you know, we all have that. We all have to say, how do I, you know, how do I turn the cell phone off or how do I get away from that saying, but this is as important as, as responding to that email or, posting that's that next big picture on Facebook. Uh, th- that time is is more important than those other distractions. And we're the only ones that can do that because the world will tug and pull us and tell us, no, do this, no, do that. Well, and, and everything's so accessible now. You know, we carry our life on our phones, our calendars there are, you know, all of our connection pieces are on our phone. And But it's also a huge distraction piece. Like how do we just set that aside and say, hey, you know what, prayer and Creating space is also as important as the stuff that we get on our phones. Definitely. I say all the time, my church hears me say the best things about us are the worst things about us. And the very best parts of us can become the worst parts about us. And I think that's true for us as a society as well. Like We've come a long way with technology and it does some wonderful things and I wouldn't give it up for anything. But it can also be the very worst thing about us when we let it kind of take over and run our life. You know, Bruce, it it occurred to me, though, that if we take a kind of a Merriam-Webster's approach to grace, it it can really become just about me and Jesus. What part do other people play in grace? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think that we all have an obligation to each other. I'm worried about our current attitude towards our, that everything is at the ends of of polarized ends that I think there's, I think we need to start seeing a little more in the gray area that we're in this together and um, we need each other. So we need to spend some time, not only, you know, us praying, but also to how are you going to find a small group or a a group of people that help you uh, be accountable for your walk and be accountable to each other, but also that we care about each other and that we're praying for others. And so I think you find that in worship. Uh, I think you find that in the church community, but I also think we need to find 
other times away from that, a small group or a, a group that we can be accountable to, but also that those are people that we can rely on when we need someone to be there for us in, 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 in terms of prayer or support. And, and so I think it's seeking out uh, the best ways to make those connections. I just love it when somebody just out of the blue shares a great story of grace with me where where God showed up in a stranger. And uh, I had one happen to me on uh, Tuesday, and I thought this would be something that maybe for your sequel. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We, we run a food pantry on Tuesdays, and we have folks come in, and, and we'll spend time talking with each individual. And about two months ago, I had been talking to this one lady that had come in, and I'd asked her, hey, what's the best thing that's happened to you this week? And she had absolutely nothing to say that had that good had happened to her. And so I said, well, when we pray in just a moment, do you mind if I pray that something great happens to you this week, that if somebody asked you what – What's the best thing that happened to you? You can just come out and say, oh, man, God bless me this way. And Hmm. I saw her again on Tuesday, and she said, I've been waiting two months to come and talk to you. That same evening, I went to – I was at Oaklawn, which is our horse track and casino here, and I was playing the penny slots. And a lady walks up to me and says – I just won, and I've always heard you share when you win. Hang on. And she came back, handed her a $100 bill, and said to her, God told me that you needed to be able to tell people something great happened to you this week. It's one of those stories that if you're not prepared to give it, Grace, you're going to, well, somebody that came to the food pantry shouldn't be at, at the casino but that's where God went and did God's work, you know, through another yeah. person. I really feel strongly that we need to respond to those urges. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've, 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 somebody has come to my mind and I've sent them an email or I gave them a call and they said, wow, something really difficult was happening in their life. And so I think, I really feel like if we'll allow God to work through us, that God can work through us. And so yeah. if someone comes to a mind, just send them a, send them a text or send them an email and say, Hey, I was just thinking about you today. You came to mind. And it's happened so many times where somebody said, wow, thanks so much. Something, something was going on in my life. And so, you know, if you feel that urge that you need to step out or volunteer or contact someone, I think that's God allowing God's sufficient grace to work through us. And so, I mean, something made the, that woman step out and say, I need to give you that hundred dollars. And the best thing that happened is she responded. Oh yeah. And I love that it happens in a very unconventional place because it seems like we tend to put grace in a box on Sunday mornings or we think God shows up at church with us. But if you read through our sacred stories, Jesus seems to always be showing up in these weird, unexpected places that good, proper religious people didn't go. Yeah. So I love that God is still showing up in unconventional places now. Yeah. And we can say, hey, that woman who was at a food pantry shouldn't have been at a casino. But that then we missed the whole point of the story that, you know, God worked through somebody in an unconventional place. Then we, we miss the story by judging what where the person uh, spends their life. If you don't go to where the lost are, the lost aren't going to come to you. That's why they're lost. If you have a child that's lost in the woods, you don't wait at home hoping they'll show up. You go out in the woods and look for them. That's right. And there's a little scripture about that, maybe something about the lost coin or the lost sheep and, you know, kind of talking about the reckless love of God. It's really the point of those parables is not not the sheep and not the coin. It's the it's the searching and it's the seeking and, and the reckless love of God in that search. Yeah, that's part of the that God's grace right there is that God loves us so much. God's willing to go wherever we're at. And it I mean, seems God's willing to go there without judgment. I agree. And, and, and I kind of, like you said, we have to go, we have to go out. And so it, we're always, we, we get sometimes comfortable in our own churches and in our own homes to say, Hey, we, we kind of like the people here and they're they're They talk like us and they, um, they act like us, but the challenge is to say, that's not where God's challenging is challenging us to be. You grew up a preacher's kid. Oh, here it comes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My kids have, I guess, been a preacher's kid for as long as they can remember. They're seven and ten now, and I don't think they remember life before they were a preacher's kid. Right. They've done some pretty crazy things in church. 
both in the building and during the services. <laughs> what was the craziest thing that you did as a preacher's kid during a children's moment or during church? And this is mainly so my wife feels better about our kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll just say, first of all, I'm, I'm actually writing a sermon uh, from James, just the challenging things of James. And, I, and I've been thinking about, you know, like the, what you do with your tongue and what, how you can control your tongue and how you can control those things. But I think the life of a preacher's kid is not an easy life. And I really thought for years, that I thought, why doesn't my dad do something? You know, why, why, can't you, why can't you fix a car or why can't you do something? So I will just tell you that some of the seeds that you're planting aren't going to sprout for a while. You're not going to see those until later. But I would say the one that I remember is that we used to do, a, I used to like to play with the sound system. And so, so I liked, you could make, you know, like different noises. Anyway, we used to play with the sound system a lot to make sure that, that we got to use that. But, um, you know, and I, sh- I remember doing some dumb things when there was a funeral going on, but um, I know my dad still, you know, I'll, well, maybe listen to this. So I don't know if I want to tell all of those <laughs> things. I think maybe that's a, uh, that's gonna, maybe I don't want to say all the things. But oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, see you messing up the sound system. Doesn't make my kid licking me during a children's sermon seem that weird. See that? Yeah. You know, you're, you're on the right, he's on the right path. And so probably the, the greatest compliment ever paid to me is that it was someone said, you know, for a preacher's kid, you're actually pretty normal. So that was probably <laughs> one of the greatest compliments ever, ever paid to me. So, <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. No, I do think that, you know, it's, and I was also in the school education school system. So, you know, those kids are always looked on like, why can't you be like this? Or why would you act that way? And at the end of the day, we're just human beings. And mm-hmm. um, I don't think we always, I don't think, I know that I personally didn't appreciate all that uh, was provided for me in terms of example and, and help me in my faith walk. Um, I tell them, I think I tell them the story in the book and story real quick. Is that, you know, short of our personal death, there was no chance that we were going to miss church. And so during my college years, I made the vow that I would not grace the doorsteps of a church. And I was very successful in that, in that, in that pledge. But after college and got married and, and I just slowly began to miss the community of a church and I missed all those things and I, and all those things that were planted early began to play back with me. And I, like Wesley, I wasn't, I can't point to a date that said, you know, this is, I accepted Christ. It was much more of this, you know, my heart was strangely warm kind of thing. And I began to appreciate much of what my dad and my mom provided for me much later. And so be patient that, you know, your planting seeds uh, will sprout someday. I think it's just their path. That was your path. And that was maybe the journey you needed to go on. And we all have that. And I wonder what it might look like for us just to make space for people to be on their journey, just to say, you need to go through this season and that's okay. We'll be here with you through it. Exactly. We're still going to be here. We're still going to be here waiting for you. And truthfully, I don't think preacher's kids are any worse than any other kid. There's just different expectations, unfair expectations, I might add, uh, that are put on many preacher's kids. Same with a school kid. I mean, my this brother that's a year older, that was your absolute perfect student and, you know, just this great, quiet, you know, perfect student. And then, then I came along the year later and I wasn't going to be that student. I mean, I had many students, many teachers say, well, why can't you act like your brother? And I thought to myself, because I have no intention to, that's not going to be my goal. So I think it's the same thing as, you know, your, your mm-hmm. teacher's kids or preacher's kids, the expectations of them is probably not where they need to be. Maybe a needed conversation in our society is what does it look like to let go of like others expectations or the comparison trap and just to be you and to make space for other people to be themselves. And I don't have a just, good answer. I don't either. How about we just, you know, show them a little grace that we know that this might be a, something they're going through and we're going to, we're going to accept them for who God loves them and cares for them. And we're going to let them go through this life. And so they know that the door is always open that for that warm embrace. I think, I think people just need to know that, that sometimes regardless of how we stepped out and made some poor decisions that there, there's always another decision that could be made later. Isn't it ironic that those of us that are supposed to be the purveyors and preachers of grace, uh, we're often the ones that uh, don't, re- or at least our children aren't the ones that receive the grace. 
Right. And it's hard. Parenting is hard. You know, I tell people a lot that, you know, the days are long and the years go fast. And and so you have long days, but then also you look back and you went, oh, my gosh, I have grandkids. How'd that happen? You know, and so just remember the days are long, but the years go fast. Yes. Well, as we are wrapping up, we'd like to know, uh, Bruce, what is it? And Jesus is a given that's saving your soul right now. Yeah, I think uh, I honestly, this is probably a probably a, a bad answer, but I think my grandkids right now um, we have a seven year old and a uh, four year old grandkids, and they are just they're just joy, and we are glad to be part of their lives. And uh, in fact, they're coming over tonight for uh, for a meal to hang out with my parents, so their great grandparents. And it's just, it's fun to see our, our relationship with them. And uh, we know that at the end of the day that we can send them home. And so that's a great thing. Uh, but they are really been, they're just, they're just joy right now. And there's one of the things that give me great perspective uh, about where we've come and in the relationship between me and my parents and their relationship between them and, and me as grandparents and great grandparents is a pretty special relationship. You know, unless you were going to say something that was illegal, I don't think there's a bad answer to that question. <laughs> well, then uh, that, you, that's acceptable. That will make oh, the yeah. cut. Then oh, we'll, yeah. we'll leave that one in. Yes. It's, oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. For sure. Here, I'll give you this. I had someone tell me recently, he goes, I think being a grandparent is the only thing in this world that's not overrated. <laughs> yeah. I, I've also said that, you know, have, your kids are overrated. Just go right to grandkids. Just, you know, <laughs> skip the kids, go right to grandkids. That's where it's at. My parents tell me all the time that grandchildren are their reward for raising me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they've kind of done their time in purgatory and now. <laughs> they get to be a grandparent. <laughs> it's about time we get some joy after all the rest of the mess. So, no, it's been we have great kids too, but it, it is a really special relationship that not everybody gets to have. And so, yeah, I don't take that for granted uh, lightly either. That people either don't have grandkids or aren't close to them. And so, um, I know that it, that's a pretty special thing for us. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Bruce. Uh, Bill will put links to both the book and your blog in the show notes. And, yeah. And I guess anything else you want to tell him to put in the show notes too. Also, <laughs> yeah, I would just, um, I, I kind of went to all, th- everything's under brucebloomer.com. You know, Bloomer is B-L-U-M-E-R. So brucebloomer.com. And there's a link to uh, on my blog, which is Parsage Parables. There's a link to our work in Haiti uh, called Laganav Alive. There's also a link to purchase the book or and the book's available on Amazon, Cokesbury, the usual kind of outlets. But all of that's under brucebloomer.com. You can kind of find the whole the whole shooting match right there. All right. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank hey, you. It's Bruce. been a great, great conversation. Thank you. And God bless you both. Thank you much. Thanks.